Yo, what is up guys, Ghost here, and today we are going over everything you need to know about Battlefield 2042 Update 4.2. As always, in this video, we're going to be getting into the nitty gritty, interesting and impactful parts of the patch notes that actually matter to you guys. We've got the big feature, which is of course the discarded map rework, but there are also a lot of important smaller changes too. Before we begin though, if you do enjoy the content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future videos. We are well on our way to 45k, that is our goal, so if you guys could hit that button for me, it'd be a massive help. So you may have heard about this first part the other day, but DICE have decided to make Uniform Soldier Aiming the new default setting for Battlefield 2042. Now I think this is a good idea, I've always used this feature in Battlefield games and I feel like it is beneficial for most players, but I think a lot of people out there simply have no idea what it is, so they simply turn it off, so here's the rundown for you. So Uniform Soldier Aiming is a feature beneficial to the process of developing good muscle memory when aiming, so it calculates the amount of input it takes for your aim to move across screen space to be consistent regardless of field of view changes. So basically if you switch from a one time sight to a four times sight, you're zooming in but it's not going to take you four times as much mouse pad to scroll the same amount of pixels across the screen. Uniform soldier aiming instead will sort of normalize it. As a result it will always take the same amount of pixel distance on the screen for a given physical movement on the mouse, and this creates more consistency between non-zoom and zoom. It's also important to note that it's not an immediate setting to improve your aim, but rather a tool which over time helps your aiming movement to gradually become more consistent during gameplay. I would also recommend guys turning on field of view FOV. What this will do is try to tie your field of view to whatever you set it to when you ADS. So if you have this as off, which I believe is the default, and you ADS, you'll go from, let's say, 90 FOV, if that's what you've got it set to, to 60 or even 50 FOV, something around that, which can be beneficial because it will sort of make the target on your screen a little bit larger, and maybe you can go for that headshot a little bit easier, but on the flip side, you lose a lot of your peripheral vision, so if an enemy pops up on the left of your screen or the right, you're not going to see them there. In addition to that, it also makes the recoil in the game appear much larger and more impactful than it actually is. Now, if you play with a controller, then you will already notice aiming variants due to aim assist. For example, your aim slowing down when close to a target alongside other similar helpful acceleration settings. But by having uniform soldier aiming on by default, what you're doing is reducing unnecessary aiming variants to help you learn the input curves on the controller sticks more consistently. It should also help your aim while using higher magnification scopes to better track fast moving targets. Now uniform soldier aiming does also come with a coefficient which is like a percentage slider that you can move up or down and it changes how impactful uniform soldier aiming is. So I believe the default here is 133%. I think it goes from 100% to 200%, something like that. 133 is, I believe, the default, and that is what I use. And that is what I would also recommend for you guys, but you can also experiment turning it up or down until you find that sweet spot. Okay, moving on, after many months of waiting, the discarded rework is finally upon us. So DICE posted a fair amount in the update notes here about how the objectives have changed and you can see some of that in the background footage here and I'll also go ahead and link the update notes down below if you want to read absolutely everything but it's probably better to get a visual feel for how the map actually looks rather than reading text and in any case you're all going to see it on Tuesday and, and play it on Tuesday and I know you're all aware so we're not going to waste any time on that really but it's coming ladies and gents and I am looking forward to it and giving you my thoughts once I've played it. Next up, we have some really nice end of round improvements. So they've introduced a new squad performance screen statistic called personal best. So on that end of round screen where your squad are walking, pretending they're actual badasses, and all those statistics pop up, you will now be notified if you set a new record for yourself for things like, you know, most kills, revives, assists, I wonder actually if there's one for most deaths too. Also, during the end of round flow, it's now possible to skip all the way to the main menu without leaving automatic matchmaking. So previously, a lot of players would finish a round, choose to go back to the main menu, thinking that would speed things up naturally, but in actuality, it kicked them out of matchmaking completely and out of that server. So that will no longer happen. You can skip to the main menu now and skip all the progression screens and matchmake faster, I assume, into the next round. 
Also, round-based game modes will now have side switching enabled and will now have increased visual communication to indicate what happens after the end of match timer ticks down. Again, more visual information for the player there is always a good thing, I think. So, you know, if you've played defense on breakthrough, you will now be switching to the attacking side. I know a lot of people get annoyed by having round after round of defense on breakthrough. They just kind of rage quit out of the server and re only to get defense again. So let it be known, guys, if you've just played defense and you stay in the server, you know, don't rematch make, you will be switched over to the attacking side next round. Okay, next up, we have a pretty small change, but one of my favorites, they've implemented the ability to remove attachments from weapons within the customization screen. I think we've all felt the frustration of having three different attachments in any given weapon slot, only ever using two of them though, and not being able to remove that third redundant attachment. I have been asking for this, and I know many of you have for a very long time, so it's great to finally see it here. Next up here, Liz's mastery requirement has seen yet another change. So her mastery used to be vehicles destroyed with her launcher. It was then quite recently changed to enemies killed when destroying vehicles with her launcher. So you needed 10 kills with her launcher for each level of mastery. And now it's been changed to 10 kills and assists when destroying vehicles with her launcher. So, you know, not a hard one to achieve there really anymore. Next, doors that were previously controlled by the enemy team will now automatically open upon getting close to them rather than having to hold the interact button. So I'm sure we've all had this happen, those annoying slidey doors that you have to hold the interact on um, usually result in you dying. You guys know the ones. So even when you've taken the objective, the enemies still own them and you'd have to retake them one by one. So as far as I understand this, now when you capture the objective, you'll just automatically gain control of the doors as well, which totally makes sense. So good one, dice. And finally, we have some rather impactful nerfs to the helicopters. So stealth helicopters that have been hit with the tracer dart can now be locked onto even in stealth mode. I know my favorite go-to stealth heli killer is the Lissile, but a lot of people aren't great with it. So if that's you, it looks like the Tracer Dart will be your new best friend. However, it's the Transport Helis that have seen the bulk of the nerfs, which is kind of funny because I just made a video about how OP they were. So they've increased the damage of heavy projectiles towards transport vehicles, including the Empat shell, that's one of the weapons on the main battle tank, and the tow missile, etc. Now the implications of this could be huge, but this is kind of vague. Firstly, how much have they increased the damage by? It doesn't say, and it's probably because it depends on the weapon. And secondly, what is included in the term heavy projectiles? In my mind here, they're talking about vehicle weaponry. So, you know, things like the tank shells, tow missiles, the two larger cannons on the Wildcat probably, possibly even the railgun tank. We don't really know, but I am pretty sure they're not talking about AA missile damage here. Now, this could include the M5 launcher, or it could not. It's difficult to say. And if it does, I would say that would be a massive nerf to the heli's survivability. I know it's super frustrating to hit one of these things with an M5 literally three times and see it not die and still survive. So I wouldn't be surprised if they have buffed it a little. However, on top of that, the Super Hind takes 20% more damage from all projectiles and the Condor takes 10% more damage from all projectiles. Now that is pretty huge. That is going to really make these things significantly easier to destroy, especially like I say with a tank, because honestly, it's not really that hard to hit a transport heli with a tank in this game. So we'll see how that plays out. You could have, you know, 20% more base damage on the tank shell and then another 20% overall direct nerf to the hind, so 40% more damage there. It's also interesting that the Condor now has higher health and tankiness than the hind. I suppose that makes sense. It's a much larger target, far harder to dodge missiles with and the like, so I definitely agree with that. And then following these changes, radar missiles now ignore targets that are below radar. So radar missiles are those ones you can unlock for the jets that are self-locking. You just dumb fire them, and they acquire a target that's in front of you. And under radar is supposed to stop all vehicle-based lock-ons from acquiring a lock when you're below, I believe, 30 meters in a jet or a helicopter. Now, that has not been the case with radar missiles, though, which is what most jet pilots use. So really good to see that now working as intended. 
So update 4.2 will be releasing next Tuesday, the 25th of April. I look forward to trying it then. I'm sure I'll see some of you guys on there. If you missed this video on just how powerful we managed to make the transport helis, go and check that one out. But otherwise, thanks for spending some time with me as always, and I'll see you guys in the next video.